We're, okay. we're rolling. All right, this is an interview with uh, Hi Rosen, the New York State World War II Women's Memorial in Albany. Uh, it is the 29th of June, 2004, approximately 10, 15 a.m. Uh, Mr. Rosen, this is your monument to the women of, who fought uh, in America's wars. Could you tell me when it was dedicated? Uh, six years ago, and uh, that's exactly the 94 uh, it was dedicated. 90, 98. Or 98, yes. excuse me. Okay. My, my math isn't too good. <laughs> but All right. Now, um, what was the process that you went through, uh, the stages you went through to have the design accepted? Well, uh, there was an invitation sent out to the sculptors, uh, it was made public, and the I assume or, or think there were uh, about 12 submissions of sculptors uh, and you had to make a presentation and a drawing and, uh, and then come before the committees and, and uh, uh, make your presentation and uh, during that process you showed the drawing and explained uh, your theory and uh, that's how they, uh, the committee made its uh, judgment. So it went through a committee and they oh, accepted yeah, your yeah. design? There, 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 were, there was a committee appointed by OGS and there were uh, uh, various uh, umbrella women's veterans group in this whole capital area, I guess. I don't know how far they went, but I had nothing to do with the selection of the committees or anything like that. But it was an OGS project, mm -hmm. a state project, and they had sent out the announcement and it was a public announcement and uh, there were submissions made. I'm, I'm, I think there were 12, they told me, or maybe more, I don't know, uh -huh. sculptures. But they winnowed it down to uh, the day I made my presentation. I think there were three or four that were making a presentation. Okay. Could you explain the memorial, memorial and what your design meant, what it means? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're uh, using the camera here because you, you can see it and it's very, very important. When I initially uh, had the uh, uh, invitation, uh, I came down here because all sculpture, in my opinion, should relate to its environment, its mm -hmm. setting, and not be something totally different. And so I came down here and one of the things I knew, uh, this, this was the area they pointed out to me in general between the Korean War Memorial that was up in, in this building here. And uh, these trees weren't as large as they are now, and uh, <clears throat> but they were small. But I, I wanted to relate to the mall, which was uh, the Rockefeller Plaza right. here. And uh, this was very, very important. So in theory, that's how I came up with these stones that repeat the shape you can see of the uh, uh, buildings back behind it and uh, and we, we made it so it faced this way so you could see that because if we had turned that way we wouldn't be able to get that sort of background so from a, a, an aesthetic design point of view you know I feel that it, it relates very well to its environs and then we uh, designed this path uh, in between the trees so it was sort of a invitation to come in and look at design. So it was a, it's not a large memorial, as you can see, but it's an intimate spot. And uh, <clears throat> the scale of it, it relates very nice to this little park area. And uh, so uh, that was the beginning of it. Now, what was the rest of your question? Well, uh, about the, the, the different uh, Design the images. Oh, why the you images, pick these okay. images yeah. uh, to put on the uh, well? The, the, that's the that's the important mm -hmm. question. How we came up with this design? Because there's a little, uh, there's been a little uh, controversy. They call it uh, not that there were that many people involved in the controversy. I mean, uh, in opposition, but uh, apparently. Uh, these uh, ladies from Syracuse, a few ladies from Syracuse, were not invited to be part of the veterans group of uh, women that were making the judging and the selection. And I did. I had nothing to do with it. Knew nothing about it. But uh, from what I can understand, they were bent out of shape. So they uh, looked for some reason to uh, criticize uh, this memorial. 
So they struck on the figure of the woman uh, in the center. And the important issue here is how, do you, how does the artist use his interpretation to represent the Women's Veteran Memorial, New York State Women's Veteran Memorial. So this is not a federal thing as much as it is a New York State Women's mm -hmm. Veteran Memorial. So I selected, I had to select a metaphor for women and, uh, and New York State. And I turned to the flag of New York State, which has two women on it. Mm -hmm. There's justice and there's uh, liberty. And so I chose Lady Liberty, but if you look at her, she's standing on the flag. She's on the left-hand side of the flag, and she's stepping on the crown, you know, the, uh, the revolutionary symbol of uh, breaking away from the British monarchy. <clears throat> but I, I, I didn't want to have a stiff, old-fashioned lady, you know, uh, that's on the flag, very, very formal. I wanted something animated and with an energy uh, symbolizing women in general and that the women are very symbolic always as a metaphor for revolution and, and fighting for liberty. You know, the French did it and we, we did. So I came up with that theme and I, I uh, sort of made a contemporary woman uh, in this uh, uh, statue. But she's the, the, the essence of what we're talking about. It's women's, New York State, women's veterans memorial. As far as the veterans identification is concerned, I took care of that on the, on the two other panels. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in a literal sense, pride, courage, and honor, you couldn't select one branch of service because this goes over the whole period. We, we're not just celebrating World War II women. That, that would be very, very uh, unfair because okay. this, this goes back right from the beginning of our revolutionary period. So this is more of celebrating women of New York who have served in, in the, the military, military from the colonial period Absolutely. to the present. That's, that, that's what my charge was as I understood it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't just celebrating the women of World War okay. II of a certain unit right. or a certain branch of service. Okay. And I wanted it to relate in a modern way, in a contemporary way, to young people who would come and look at this, <clears throat> you know, in future years. So they could look at it and have a feeling of, uh, uh, you know, some relationship. But on the two other panels, we go from, <coughs> excuse me, go from the history, uh, you know, the, the, the first women, uh, that's the, the, the figure there, in the revolutionary period, who these women followed our, our men in the army mm -hmm. and uh, handed them guns and, uh, and I researched this. There was a, a, a tremendous amount of research going into it and I had a, uh, a historian, a military historian from the National Guard uh, doing, helping me out with this. And so everything is accurate in detail in all research, the guns, the, the, the clothes that she has, everything, the shoes, anything that she's wearing, and to the, the, the minutia of detail that I have there is, is all accurate. Now then, then we go to the, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we sort of skip, we can't catch every period, but, but from the first revolutionary period, to, with, the, with the fort in the background, then we go to the Civil War, and women, in order to serve, dressed like men, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, because there was no women's right. war, and they served very much in the uh, pharmaceutical uh, areas of, of, of the military, and so that represents that. And then on the, the other side is Harriet Tubman. <coughs> And she, uh, during the, during the uh, uh, Civil War, helped with the underground uh, uh, getting uh, the slaves up here in the north. And so we symbolized her in this thing because she sort of represented a woman in the military. And uh, so that's covered. The, the central figure, she's holding the flag of New York State and she's kicking the crown, 
you know, uh, separating us from uh, the, the British, uh, period. And she, she sort of has an energy coming out of the stone, you know, she just coming out of it, isn't it? Isn't just standing there and uh, preening or anything like that. And then here we come to the, our, our modern, more modern time. We start off with <coughs> World War II period, where the first uh, women were in the Signal Corps, and very much uh, what, what, what they did. And uh, that's represented there. And, and uh, next to that is, is a World War I scene with the, with the uh, uh, men in, in overseas. <coughs> and then um, we have uh, all the different women in every branch of service up on top of the heads, representing every uh, branch of, of uh, World War II of service. And, uh, so, you know, we're trying to cover all bases of the limited amount of space. <coughs> and they have the Vietnam War and the Korean War and the, the women that served in the medics. And uh, you can see the helicopters in the, the mountains of Korea. And then the, the, the final figure was the uh, Persian Gulf War. Uh, and uh, this is a more contemporary uh, military woman. Uh, and you know, her, her ethnic background, and, uh, <laughs> arms that she carried, everything is researched in detail. Now, these are the formal representation of the military, but it certainly is, is a story. It's, it's not one uh, branch of service that, uh, uh, you know, some of these women wanted to be celebrated, you know, an ego bit, you know. Mm -hmm. this, this, I tried very hard to cover this in a general way so that women would feel proud about their service and, uh, and the country. Okay, um, do you uh, find, this is six years after the, the, the dedication, that you have this controversy all of a sudden, uh, do you find it unwarranted? Oh, definitely unwarranted and it's unfounded because the, the group represents a minuscule, <laughs> minuscule uh, group of ladies that have an agenda. I mean, if you check it out, uh, there's nothing controversial, there's nothing sexy about, uh, you know, I had to go through all kinds of uh, aggravation and, and explain to these women. I remember uh, they brought them down so that I could explain to them what I meant by this statue. And uh, one lady got up and said, uh, this woman is wearing a toga, and I've been to toga parties, and I know what goes on in to uh, at toga parties. And uh, she started crying, like, uh, you know, and they were claiming that I was being, uh, you know, provocative in, in terms of making women a sexual symbol. And uh, nothing could be further from the truth. But, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 it's, it's a combination of a few disgruntled ladies who have every right to express their opinions, but they were not on the official committee. Mm -hmm. We had uh, uh, the... the Women's Veterans Group represented, and they they made the selection. Do you think, um, in retrospect, would you uh, would you change any of the design at all? <clears throat> Not really. I, I I think it's a beautiful design. In retrospect, I uh, you no, know, you know, if I knew this controversy was going to come up or something like that, I would have maybe thought about what what. You know, uh, hindsight is what you're yes, asking. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, uh, what what could I have done if I had the, the, the central figure? I can't make it one branch of service. Mm -hmm. I mean, World War One, World War II, uh, which war am I going to, uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, which, which one deserves, when you're talking about women having served, you know, you can't say women of World War II uh, that, that, that are the total representation of, of women. That's unfair. At least in my opinion, that's the way I think it and look at it. Somebody else may have another idea. Sure, you could put uh, her in a military uniform, but which which uniform do yes. I pick? What war? 
All right, so uh, in, in conclusion, I guess uh, I just read what Colonel Francis Liberty, who was on the committee, right. uh, said. She called it a beautiful piece of art. So, Thank you. Okay. And uh, she was correct. <laughs> if, right. I, if I say so myself. All right. I'm going to uh, pan in on the, the text of each panel over here. I'll get some of that in. Guys, go back to work now. Yes, they can. <laughs> is Hyman Joseph Rosen and I've been called High Rosen you know ever since uh, early teenage um, and my uh, present address yeah, your date of birth and place of birth please place of birth was Albany New York February 10th 1923 okay um, do you read what was your educational background prior to entering service uh, I was a graduate of Philip Schuyler High School in Albany and attended there, went to uh, Chicago Art Institute right after that and uh, was there for a year and uh, then I went to the Art Students League in New York City for a year and a half and then I enlisted in the service but I had education after I got out of service. I uh, had a uh, Professional Journalism Fellowship at Stanford University. That was awarded, you know, by committee. And then I attended uh, sculpture classes at SUNY, and I've studied art off and on regularly, you know, throughout my life. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I, I audit art classes, painting classes at St. Rose. Okay. President. Um do you recall where you were in your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yeah, very vividly. I was a young kid uh, walking up the hill on Catherine Street when the, the announcement was made on radio and I had heard it and I went outside and there was just a buzz. Uh, you know, people just didn't know what was going to happen, but I can remember the family huddled uh, next to the Atwater Kent, I guess it was, the old radios at the time, listening to Franklin D. Roosevelt make his famous uh, address about the day of infamy. 
And, uh, you know, we, we had uh, the image of uh, <clears throat> the Japanese stabbing us in the back. I was, even at that age, I was uh, very conscious of images. Matter of fact, I remember drawing a cartoon, a poster that won uh, an award for an American magazine, uh, won some kind of award. And uh, what it had, and I still have that, that poster, but it was very prophetic. I had uh, the, 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 an, um, an American man standing there like the Minuteman, and the Minuteman is behind him with his hand on his shoulder, and he's looking towards Europe, and coming across the ocean is a, a gorilla uh, with, with a swastika on one arm and the hammer and sickle on the other arm uh, coming towards America. And this was in... 1940 or 39 probably uh, it was 1939 when I did this and so I could envision I was doing sort of political cartoons then okay now uh, you said you you enlisted yeah I, I am volunteered I was going to art school at the art students league I'd been there for about a, a year or more and uh, the war was on, and uh, I never had a draft card that I can recall or anything like that because in Albany, and I was pretty young, I was uh, 18 or 19, I guess. I, I sure wasn't more than 19. And uh, uh, the, the, these men, officers, would come to the art school and, and talk to us, uh, you know, about enlisting. In, in the camouflage battalion because we were artists and that our uh, background would, would be uh, useful and helpful. And so I, I knew eventually I'd be drafted so I might as well enlist in something that I could uh, have, a, have some relationship with because it had some artistic uh, touches. Well, needless to say, it was a Corps of Engineers, you know, very few, uh, the only, the closest they got to art was paintbrush and, you know, doing walls. But I did some murals and VD posters and things like that early in basic training, you know, as part of the business. But, uh, I, you know, I volunteered and enlisted and uh, I, I enlisted down in New York City, but I, I came home to tell my parents and then I went down to New York City and went in. This was December of 42, you said? Yeah. Okay. Where did you go for your basic training? Uh, Camp Campbell, Kentucky. And the reason I went there, I, I had to take the um, ride down there. You know, uh, first you went into Camp Mead, I guess it was, you know, just to get all examined and checked out. And then they uh, put me on a train all by myself to, to go down to Camp Campbell, Kentucky. And I remember coming in there and, you know, I had long hair and all that sort of stuff. And it was, uh, I can always recall these sad little stories, but uh, uh, the sergeant picked me up, uh, you know, at the train station, uh, took one look at me and he says, you're going to have to get a haircut. And uh, because... Tomorrow is inspection, Saturday, and uh, we don't want you with the, well, where was I going to get a haircut? Well, I don't know. That's your problem. You know, maybe there's a PX open. So anyway, there was nothing open. Uh, it was a Friday night, and uh, I remember trying to cut my hair myself. I had an electric shaver. <laughs> I tried to shave my head, and it looked like a, a rat or something that ate all the chunks of hair out. But I, I was a messy looking guy is all I can say for the next, uh, so I didn't make too good an impression I don't think when I first got in. How long was your basic training and what kind of training did you receive there? Well, uh, it was nine months and it was uh, uh, at Camp Campbell and, and uh, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to <coughs> recall all the exact uh -huh. details and they're in here, but uh, Apparently, this whole uh, idea of a camouflage battalion were special troops. As a matter of fact, we went down, we, we went, I took my wife and daughter, uh, we had a reunion of uh, our, some of our uh, men uh, 
was it back back 10, 12 years ago. But we were at uh, Fort Meade, where, where where this camouflage uh, battalion originated, and they were special troops. They were trained to be assigned to different armies, and uh, so that was the charge of our our outfit. Uh, you know. Uh, They'd be companies would be sent out to different armies and do the camouflage installations for them and uh, that sort of thing. And How did you receive the, the normal basic training? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We uh, I was just looking at it. we had the 25 mile marches. Mm -hmm. Remember the blisters on my feet and all that sort of stuff. But uh, it's just uh, we had the. 25 mile uh, hikes and it says uh, became famous at Campbell as the marching this unit in the second army uh, 25 mile hikes were being the rule not the exception uh, and they were strenuous days I remember I was a young kid you know in uh, pretty good shape and there were a lot of uh, older men you know when I say older there were men in their 40s at that time they were drafting men in their 40s who, who were just dropping like flies and, the, and they had gotten into this camouflage outfit because they were art directors and all that sort of fancy titles but it really didn't apply too much uh -huh. so uh, it was a rigorous rigorous uh, basic training uh, so almost immediately then you were assigned to a specialized unit well, not immediately. No, I was with headquarters company, and the unit, the battalion stayed together, and we, they were only assigned when we got overseas. And we went to England first, uh, Bracknell, uh, England, and uh, then we went to Potter's Bar. Uh, there's a whole at Bushy Park now. At Bushy Park, that's outside of London, uh, was Eisenhower's headquarters, and <clears throat> we had a camouflage. Um, it was interesting because the, the Germans would be bombing and they'd try to find Eisenhower's headquarters and uh, they would line up on, uh, there was a little uh, uh, park there, a bushy park, and it, it had a, a, a water fountain, a big pool, Lady Diana was in the middle, and at night that f fountain would reflect, you know, the moon mm -hmm. would reflect, and that was one of their... Uh, uh, points for, for finding uh, Eisenhower's headquarters. So the, those are the things they had to do is camouflage that. But uh, yeah, I, I can remember one of the things that sticks out in my mind, but we wanted to cut some trees and we, we, we couldn't do that because uh, in England uh, you had to have the, the, the queen's uh, or the king's uh, in perimeter or something to cut a tree. Mm -hmm. That's how uh, conservation conscious they were, you know, even during a war, so that they uh, kept the thing as it was, you know, pre preserving. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was just uh, there, and uh, we, we were in England, and the idea. Can I go back a second? Um, yeah. How did you get over to England? Did you go by convoy or a single ship or? No, a Liberty ship, a convoy, all, all the ways across, yeah. And uh, it was a bumpy ride, I remember, <laughs> the, 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 you know, food sliding down, sliding back, and I was uh, giving it back some of it to the ocean and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Now, uh, so when you got to England, you're basically, your duties were to camouflage uh, uh, in England, it, and, and it was areas. in England. It was more uh, training and exercise okay. of uh, uh, you know being military. Mm -hmm. You know, the regular military training. But it was uh, uh, I was uh, assigned as a photographer, uh, and uh, you know I took pictures, and I was assigned to headquarters company, so you know I could uh, take pictures of all the rest of the battalion, all the rest of the companies. Did you have to develop your own film? Yeah, oh, that's, that was funny. They made me a photographer, and I guess they didn't know what else to do with me, a guy who painted and drew pictures and stuff. You know, if you were, if you were a, a mechanic or a painter or a carpenter, you could do well in the camouflage battalion, get the rank. So the best I could make was T5 technician. 
and uh, that was the table of organization, and, the, and they had a photographer listed, and uh, so they gave me a four by five speed graphic uh, camera, and threw me in the John. That was my dark room, so that's where I had water, you know, so I could develop film. I didn't have a clue what the hell I was doing, and uh, I learned by trial and error, and lots of error at the beginning. I remember one of the assignments I had to do was uh, photograph, oh yeah, this was at Camp, at camp Campbell, they were having the dedication of the camp, and a general was arriving and all that stuff, and they were, they were putting their hands in cement, like, you know, they do out in Hollywood and that kind of stuff for the dedication. And, uh, you know, I was taking pictures and all that sort of stuff. And, and then uh, after the event, I realized I had left my shield in the, in the film pack and hadn't gotten any of the pictures. I was lucky I didn't get court-martialed. <laughs> But, uh, you know, just the, the little mistakes that you went through. Uh, so I, w I wasn't exactly the, the sterling example, you know. You had to learn by experience. But I wasn't alone. Uh, there were a lot of guys that had to get booted in the rear. But it, w it was tough. Uh, it wasn't easy. I know that. But, uh, hey, you went through it. Okay, how long were you in England? Uh, we were in England, uh, I think, about <clears throat> nine months or thereabouts. I, I mean, it's in the in the record in the, in the book here. Uh, let me see. It might be, you know, I, I don't want to give you a phony dates. But anyway, it, 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 the 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 battalion was all over the lot. You know, that doesn't mean. Uh, headquarters companies went to some of the places, didn't go to all of them. But part of the charge was we were building decoys so that when the invasion came, you know, one of the uh, LSD ships would tow uh, a decoy, a camouflage thing, so it would look like uh, the invasion was coming from a certain point, but it wasn't. So that was uh, our job. So. Uh, were these decoys a lot smaller than a, a standard size ship? No, they were the same proportion because everything was, uh, uh, you know, they were the LSDs. Everything, what, what, aerial photography was the thing that they they studied and examined. So mostly it was the shadow that was cast, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the from the decoy. So it didn't have to be, you know, exactly in detail. Just the shape. That was the Could whole. you go into more detail on how you made some of these decoys, how you went about making them? Yeah, well, all part of the training was uh, the decoys was were to draw enemy fire uh -huh. away from the real targets. So a lot of our uh, work in, in uh, England was to, uh, you know, they had these blackouts at night, but under the best of conditions in a blackout, you had light uh, escaping, you know, there'd be accidental lights coming from different places. So what we set up was a, uh, uh, you'd have like nothing but uh, little little baskets with lights underneath them. And when they flew over, it would look like a town or something. And uh, it would look like the light, some accidental homes uh, or Homes had uh, their lights on, and uh, then we would have uh, cans. I remember drums of oil, which we would ignite. So when the Germans were having a raid, you know, I remember it was either Liverpool or, or, or some of the things there. They 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 were confused because these decoys were near the target. So at at uh, at best. Uh, they, 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 you know, uh, uh, have to dump in two places because they weren't sure. Be right next to the real target. Uh, but uh, what we were trying to do is draw the fire to the uh, to the decoy. So they would be, in essence, bombing an unpopulated area. Yeah, yeah, that was the whole idea. Just get them to waste their their uh, you know arms or bombs. Now, what were the purpose? What was the purpose of the oil drums? 
to look like they hit the target. Oh, they, okay. they, when they, they yeah, they, 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 they report back. We, we'd set it off, you know, with the uh, line, and uh, the thing would go off, and a big smoke would come up, and and then you'd hear reports the next day where they had uh, made a bombing and all this damage was done, and we knew it wasn't accurate. Did you ever make the uh, the tanks that were decoys and? Uh, yeah. Camera? Well, I was I was a photographer, so I oh, didn't sorry. I didn't get involved in the, in you know the uh -huh. construction of those things. But uh, I remember I had to study photos, and we, we studied and, and the aerial photos. We were trying to find a sub base in France. We knew it was in a certain area, and we we studied uh, these. Um, Photographs, and uh, uh, we noticed that you know it was it was a pasture field there, and over a period of about two or three days, the cows were in the same spot. You know the the, the shadows we were studying were in the same spot, so we knew that it w must have been in that area, the decoy, because these were decoys. No cows are they, they move. And uh, they didn't move their uh, decoys, so they bombed it, and it was a very successful raid. They had gotten a sub uh, base, but uh, you know, I didn't uh, uh, build decoys uh -huh. per se. You know, like you have an image. But w what we did mostly was uh, that uh, was camouflage nets over buildings, as I pointed out. Uh, over a little lake, uh, like a pond that Eisenhower's headquarters, so the reflection wouldn't show mm -hmm. at night. You break it up, um, uh, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it was more engineering. Anybody who was a rigger or an engineer or things like that. But what we did, uh, we studied uh, the activation of mines and bridge, you know, pontoon building and that kind of stuff. Um, now, where, uh, after you left England, where did you go? Well, you know, England, we were getting bombed, you know, we weren't mm -hmm. getting bombed, but we were in areas that were bombed, and, you know, people go in the shelters, and we go there. But after uh, England, we went to uh, France, and we uh, landed in, uh, uh, where did we land? Saint-Malo is where, uh, where I, my outfit went, but there were other companies that went with different uh, armies that landed in different spots. But uh, we went to St. Malo and uh, I remember uh, going over and, you know, uh, it was a traumatic feeling of uh, crossing a channel, knew what you were getting into. This was about, uh, uh, I'd say, four to six weeks after D-Day. And uh, fortunately for us, but uh, we, we found out later on, I mean, this is an aside, that uh, our, our uh, colonel uh, uh, of our outfit was trying to use our outfit as a decoy outfit that we would uh, draw the fire away from uh, the uh, people who made the, the general invasion. And it was a place where we would have been decimated, you know, with the decoys, but fortunately, uh, Eisenhower's headquarters didn't accept that plan. But uh, I remember we landed early in the morning. It must have been five, six o'clock in the morning. It was, it was uh, in the summer, I think. Yeah, yeah, it had to be. So it would have been in August or something like that. But uh, it's all in here. But uh, anyway, it, everything was all. Uh, there were dead animals around, you know, uh, cows and all that, and the big bomb potholes. And, uh, and the first experience I had, they had designate, designated me as an interpreter because I had high school French. And three years of high school French really didn't make me an interpreter, but they gave me a Berlitz uh, course on the, on the boat that a record that I listened to so when when we landed I, they, the major said Rosen 
you know, find some Frenchman and find out where we can get some fresh water or clean water or something like that. And so I, uh, I ran into this woman, you know, an old lady, and uh, she, you know, uh, they were not thrilled to see us because we had been bombing the hell out of them. So they just hated us as much as the Germans, I guess. But uh, the, the, the irony of it was, as an interpreter, I ran into this woman, and it was in Normandy, and, 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 and uh, the French in Normandy have an accent. <clears throat> it would be like uh, somebody from Mississippi trying to talk to somebody from Boston. You know, the two <laughs> accents were totally different. You know, and I had studied what French I knew was Parisian, uh, you know, the classic French, and I gave her my best lines and everything. She didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And she answered me and I didn't know what the heck she was saying. And besides that, she listened and wasn't too happy. So <laughs> that was another failure on my marking. But, uh, you know, I remembered it. But uh, we uh, we made out, we found some water. And what uh, beach did you land on? Jeez, uh, I, I can't remember. But it was a Saint Lo, uh, Saint Malo, uh, and uh, the beach there. You know, we just drove off in trucks. You know, you just did what you were told to do. And uh, um, the, the 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 history of it is in this book, which uh, I'll have to read sometime because I haven't. <laughs> you know, when you get out of service, it's it's closed case. You, you, you don't want to remember it, you know. Uh, certain thoughts will come back, you know, like crazy little stories like I'm telling you now. But uh, there, there are fellas in the outfit that can remember every detail, you know. When you get these reunions, they'll, phew, you remember this, you remember that, you know, we landed here. And it, and it was uh, somehow uh, not too happy experiences. I sort of blank out, you know, I just try to. Uh, not to remember them too well, but there were a lot of experiences. Anyway, you know, we we, we landed in France and then moved right up to um, we moved up to Rennes uh, is the one I can remember, and uh, that was a long trip. But uh, you know, uh, what, why did we go to Rennes? Oh, 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 we we were. Uh, it was a. Um, a place for fuel, uh, fueling station, big uh, fueling station, and Patton's army was using that area. So we were working on that and doing camouflage. And, uh, and you know, so they, all, excuse me. Basically, when you got there, you put up the netting. Is that? Yeah, what yeah. Over over fly? trucks and mm -hmm. uh, areas, camping areas, and things like that, and military. Installations, you know, guns, whatever uh, they they had to do, yeah. and uh, you know, I, I'd be running around taking these pictures that are in this this book, you know, so they could keep the records on it. But uh, here, here's Rens, uh, and uh, we landed. We'll never forget Normandy, and. Did you have any uh, encounters with the German army? Uh, no, not my outfit, but the other companies did. The headquarters company didn't. Uh, they were always retreating, or you know, we were behind them. So uh, uh, I remember in Rennes, I, well, we, we picked up a lot of the wine bottles that they left, and it was my first introduction to cognac. You know. And, uh, they had taken care of themselves, you know, they confiscated everything. So what was left, we, we sort of took over. But uh, arriving in Rennes, last Germans were being mopped up. We took over a former German Marine depot, and we immediately put it into operation. An emergency pipeline was needed to carry high-octane aviation gas, assisting in the reconstruction of bombed-out pumping station laying about two miles of pipe and the repair of a tank farm left by retreating Germans. Once, we, once more, we successfully completed a job for which we were neither trained nor equipped. So 
you know, this, that sort of sums it up. It, it wasn't a classic book kind of thing. You, you, you were used and, you know, it was the situation that you found yourself in. Uh, well, you know, we went through Brittany and deactivated mines and all that, and uh, and then uh, our guys did uh, all these different things, uh, different. Uh, and then we got to Paris. That was the big. Uh, that was the big uh, uh, stay and the big experience. Uh, we got to Paris and uh, we did uh, factory operations there and labor supervision and uh, we we uh, took over factory and uh, built these nets with the with the French people and uh, and uh, made all this camouflage netting. Now, how did you find yourselves uh, accepted there by the, by the French? Uh, my own to you there? personal experience, it, it, it was different. Uh, you know, where I remember the, the, the fellows in the outfit uh, were all complaining about the French and their this and that and that. But I got along very well because, as I said, I could speak a little bit of French. And I made an effort to speak French. And when you did that, it made all the difference in the world, you know. So I wasn't hitting the bars or anything like that to pick up the girls. I'd just go into a bakery or something like that and and see a nice looking girl and I'd give her an orange and use my French from there. But uh, that was, uh, you know, it, it was funny the way uh, the guys reacted. But <clears throat> but uh, anyway, uh, the stay in uh, in Paris was very interesting and. Uh, you know, I became acquainted with uh, some French families and things like that. And uh, our outfit went to Belgium. You know, our companies went to Belgium and Holland. And uh, and they went to, uh, uh, some of them went to Germany, and uh, but I did not. So it was... Uh, so you spent most of your time in Europe and yeah, France. Yeah, yeah, it was in, in, in Europe and mm -hmm. France. That was the headquarters company. But, you know, there, there were times like during the Battle of the Bulge, you know, they would fall, uh, fall us out in the morning. We stayed in a, a little hotel that was in the industrial area of, <clears throat> of France. And uh, you, 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 and it was that, that random, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't know whether you were going to be picked or not, you know, by the grace of God, get on a truck and... Now, did you uh, carry any weapons? Oh, yeah, you know, I had to train... What, what did you carry? I had a carbine. I mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, was the, the, the M1 uh, was what we basic trained with, mm -hmm. and then when we were in uh, France, I had a carbine all the time. But, uh, anyway, that's, that's the way it went right to VE day, or... It's a VJ day. That's that's uh, that was the happy day. But uh, where were you when uh, you heard about the victory in, in Europe? The war was over. We were uh, where was I? Uh, oh, I was on a boat going to. I was in Marseille. And I was I was heading to. No no no. Excuse me. I think I was in Paris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, we were celebrating in Paris, yeah. But I, I w w went to Marseille. We were, we were supposed to go to the uh, the Pacific, you know, and be assigned over there. But when, when we were on the boat, uh, Truman dropped the, the, the uh, bomb on Japan, and uh, that sort of ended the war. The, the, the uh, Japanese capitulated. What so, was your reaction when you heard about the dropping the atomic bombs? God bless Harry Truman. I think he was the greatest, not the greatest, but definitely one of the great presidents we had because, you know, what makes a, a president great, a leader great, is uh, the moments of truth, how they, how they react in crisis situations. And they have the guts and the, you know, character and integrity. And Truman had that, in my view. How did you feel when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? 
oh, we cried like babies, you know, when we were over there. I remember that very, very clearly. And, uh, you know, that at that time, he was our leader, and uh, we loved him and so forth, you know. In retrospect now, you know, you study things and you learn things, and, you know, the guy wasn't uh, golden as we thought, but he's definitely one of the most charismatic leaders we ever had. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he certainly uh, left a mark on my life because as a kid, I remember he was governor of New York State, and uh, I'd go up to Eagle Street where the mansion was, and occasionally we'd see him, and that kind of thing. So I know my recently went through Hyde Park and uh, the museum there, and that, that brought back fond memories. But Roosevelt was like <laughs> Roosevelt. It was, you know, we, we were talking about a, a period of history, uh, you know, the last 70 years or so, and uh, an awful lot of important things happened. And, uh, and the leaders, uh, in retrospect, were, were really big men and uh, held up to the job, but you never know, you know, you can only judge these things when you get back far enough, you, it's hard to make total judgments, you know, true judgments when you're involved in the thing, you know, history has a way of uh, sorting things out. And even though you were, were in France, were you ever aware of the concentration camps or the labor oh, camps? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, not to the full degree that we learned after mm -hmm. we got out, but we saw what the, what they had done. Oh, yeah, in Paris, went to, uh, I, went, I was in one place, and I've got pictures of it home, where they had uh, the firing squad things, you know, where the Nazis were shooting uh, people and tying them up and that sort of stuff. Yeah, like, like a torture chamber. And, uh, of course, the, the, the French always had stories of the individual French people that you saw and spoke to. And uh, they were seemed to be very, very grateful to uh, the Americans at, at that time, and as well they should be. You know, we liberated them. And uh, there was a, a great feeling of, uh, thank God for the Americans, they saved us. But... Uh, some of the GIs just didn't get along because, the, you know, they, they, they weren't educated too well. You know, a lot of these fellows were the first pair of shoes they ever had when they got into the outfit. Um, when did you return to the United States? Uh, whatever my <laughs> discharge thing says. You know, as I said, I left from Marseille, uh -huh. and uh, what was it, three years later, 42 to 45, I think. Is that right? I know you said on the paper here yeah. it's November 45. I, I can't read, can't it. read that. Yes. So, so, I think it's November 45, yeah. And uh, yeah, I came home then, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, it was nip and tuck. We were in Marseille, and we were, the, the orders were we were going overseas to, uh, they didn't tell us where, but we were going to be going to Japan, we assumed. And, uh, and then they said, no, we're going to go this back home. Uh -huh. Well, that made us feel good, and we, we landed happy, happy. You know, it, it, the grace of God, you never know when you get into the service. You can't uh, call your shots, you know yes. that. Yes. And huh? so, On a lighter side, did you get to see any USO shows or anything like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw a Bob Hope show. I went down to, uh, where the heck was it, Nice, France. And uh, I was on furlough. I went down there and uh, I saw part of his show. And part of the time I was with a lady or something like that. But th those were the things you did in the army. You know, you, first thing you did was look for some recreation. You know. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you ever, uh, while you were in Paris, did you ever go to art galleries or yeah, so on? Well, because you I had went the to art the art background. Yeah, the uh, the uh, Frenchman, this uh, baker. Uh, Monsieur Bonvin, his name was good wine, a well-named man, but uh, he had this little bakery shop next to where we were stationed, and uh, bakers were very, very important because they dealt with 
food and uh, everything was bartered and you know you, if you were a baker you could barter with somebody for clothes or whatever to other food and all that sort of stuff so the, the bread was just basic so uh, he, he was a pretty important guy but I made friends with him by bringing an orange into the girl who gave it to the, his wife because she had been sick and they hadn't seen oranges in years maybe uh, but uh, Anyway, he, he uh, took me to the he took me to dinner at his house, you know, whatever it was. It could have been a told me it was a rabbit, and then later on somebody told me it might have been a cat, you know. <laughs> but uh, the French have a great way with uh, cooking all kinds of delicacies out of the worst garbage you could eat. But um, he took me to the opera, uh, the Petite Opera. In, in Paris, which was a great experience during the war. And I remember how cold it was when they opened the curtain. The cold air came blown out from the street and all that. But I saw Madame Butterfly. I'll never forget that. Magnificent. But uh, so that was the cultural experience, and it was only through my association with him. And uh, and he introduced me to a lot of friends. You know, they, they, they liked me because I spoke some French and they would make, and, and uh, I say I spoke, I fractured French is what I did. And uh, he would call his friends and, uh, oh, listen to this, you know, because, uh, you know, my expressions were all based on American interpretation. And uh, that would be hilarious to the French. After you were discharged, did you... Uh make use of the GI Bill at all? Yeah, I was uh, thinking of it, but I didn't. After I was discharged, I, w I wasn't home more than two weeks. And my sister told me about an opening in the art department at the Times Union. I went down there and I showed him some pictures. And uh, he, uh, he tried me out. He, he asked me to draw a cartoon. And I did. And uh, it was, uh, the first cartoon was on, oh, it was, uh, it was, it was a Hearst paper, and he threw a telegram at me that was from William Randolph Hearst. That was a senior, and it said that to all editors, Hearst used to send telegrams to all his papers. He had about 30 papers in, and they would uh, all follow the same uh, uh, editorial policy. You know, it was dictated, and support the troops coming home and all that. And that, that was the idea. So I drew this little the cartoon uh, that they used on the editorial page of a uh, a bond, the bond drive, and it had a little GI waving to the Statue of Liberty, and the bond was in the shape of a ship, you know, cutting through the water, coming into the the port, and uh, that was my first cartoon, and it was my initiation, and this sort of got me started because they never had an editorial cartoonist there. And uh, little by little, I uh, began to do more and more serious subjects, and I was reproduced in different papers, uh, New York Times, Time Magazine, things like that. And uh, I won a couple of awards, and so they gave me more and more freedom and more responsibility. But that's my career in a newspaper business. That's not my military career. Did you ever use the 5220 club? 5220? The, uh, for 52 weeks, $20 a week, it was kind of an unemployment after you no. were discharged? No, I, I, as I said, I, you, yes, I, I got a job you, yes. uh, right away, so I blew the uh, GI Bill in terms of I, uh, my buddies were going to uh, Cannes and uh, France and, you know, going to really, uh, I was thinking of going to one of the good art schools, you know. But uh, as it turned out, I, I, I was very practical. I got a bird in a hand, you know, I had a job, keep that. And, you know, being an artiste, would, uh, not exactly, uh, wasn't a guarantee to put bread on the yes. table. Thank God I didn't, I, I can say this in retrospect, it was like 1% uh, of the artists maybe can uh, earn enough money to uh, raise a family and, Unless you're a teacher or doing some something else uh, in the artistic field, you, you it's hard to uh, support yourself by selling your paintings. 
So that that was it, and I uh, pursued a, a cartoon, political cartoon field, and made a job out of that. But uh, and I stayed with the Times Union for 45 years, so I wasn't exactly a, a guy who flitted about, you know. And I built on that because Albany was a capital and uh, good subject matter, and uh, and then uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, about. 20 years ago, or maybe 25 years ago, something like that, uh, I started sculpture and started doing that. Okay. Did you join a veterans organization? Yep. Mm -hmm. I uh, uh, joined the uh, Jewish War Veterans here, and I was a past commander. So I've been in that. And, yeah, I marched in the parades occasionally, you know. And, uh, you know, at the beginning I didn't. You know, as I said, uh, you sort of closed it off. It was it wasn't one of those experiences that you wanted to sit down and talk to everybody about, and you know, like they're finding out that the guys and uh, most of the guys in World War II don't even want to talk about it. You know, it's 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 a it's a hard thing to talk about. It was it was a painful thing. The one thing I keep thinking of, uh, I don't think we could have. Uh, one World War Two, and even been in it, if we had the media coverage the way we have now. I'm absolutely convinced yes, of it. Never would have made it. Because they'd have been on their back the minute they had a dead body, you know. And you can't fight a war that way. No. It's impossible. Did you uh, ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Yeah, yeah, I had some friends in there. We, they used to visit together. As a matter of fact, this fella, Sergeant Bain, he lives down in uh, somewhere around Rockland County, in Westchester, yeah. And he was an artist. A lot of the guys that were in the outfit were artists. and uh, But he was a commercial artist, and they were most of them were older than I was. I was one of the younger ones. And uh, we were in touch, and we'd visit together and that stuff. But I didn't have anybody in this immediate area that was in my outfit because, as I said, I went down there. And so most of the guys in that outfit were from Tennessee and Kentucky. And it was a big group from New York, but they were from the city. So uh, when we had reunions, we, uh, I still get cards from some of the guys. They had terrific people. And... Uh, that was my next question. You, you've gone to reunions then? Uh, we, we had uh, one or two. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I did one time on my own was took my wife and daughter, uh, sort of retraced the steps we, we, we did in France and all that, and took them to, uh, I, I remember we went to Paris and Rennes and some other spots. And, uh, but that was, you know, a personal mm -hmm. thing. How do you think your time in service uh, changed or affected your life? <laughs> well, you know, if you, it, it's got to be one of the major things in your life, mm -hmm. definitely, definitely. I mean, I was a kid, a little Jewish kid out of high school, and, and you know, went a couple of years of art school. Uh, so naive in the world. I mean, totally uh, sheltered little life here, exposed to the, totally exposed to the world, the real world. It was a, an enormous education. And uh, uh, I certainly, without advocating wars, I certainly would uh, be an advocate of universal military training, that all, all young people should serve at least one year not two, in the military after high school. Uh, young men and, and women, for that matter, although I don't know how that, that's another subject, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, I definitely am, uh, am, am an advocate of universal military training. I think it's, it's good for the people. It makes them feel like they're part of their country and they understand, you know, that they, they've got a vested interest. They did something for the country, they're part of it, not not just uh, outside uh, critic. When I, uh, you know, 
I want to get into political philosophies here too much, or I'll get a whole uh, thing going. Okay. Well. Okay. Thank you very much for your interview. Thank you.